So it's a very stereotypical rap video. It's got a, like a Bugattis in it and Audis and jet skis and gold plated footballs and gold plated toilets. And, and they're playing on ex expensing it all the time. So they got to expense all these things in the rap video. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. So David, a few weeks ago, maybe it was last week, can't remember, we were talking about unlimited PTO and the benefits of that. Uh, I have unlimited PTO here at my company, which I very much enjoy uh, taking advantage of. I think Will Farnell announced that, right? Like, hey, this is a new thing for my firm I'm doing in 2019. Yes, for his firm, Farnell Clark uh, in the UK, uh, 20 people approximately on LinkedIn in that firm, which is, uh, you know, uh, innovative. Uh, a good number of small firms are starting to do that sort of thing. Well, Kelly Mann, a listener of the show, she is at the CPA Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, on Twitter. She tweeted at us and said, another case for unlimited PTO, female retention. Kelly says that she uses a third of her PTO on vacation, a third on her sick kids, and a third that she hoards so that she can have paid maternity leave. Women have different PTO needs than men. When can we recognize that and come up with a solution? I have to say, I completely agree that you know, women end up, I mean, this is just based on my own experience with my wife, that they end up using their PTO on basically not on vacation. A lot of it's just like taking care of their kids, like going to doctor's appointments. And you know, I'm lucky to have unlimited PTO. So uh, if she runs out, I can use mine and you know, that sort of thing. She also has a flexible job. Uh, she works remotely, gets to set her own hours, so she doesn't have to use a ton of her PTO, but it's still significant. Yeah, and I was kind of really thinking about this, you know, when um, I was a single parent there for a while, right? And you're you're always having, like, yeah, you're having to use up your, your sick time and your paid time off for when other people in your family are sick, right? It's mm -hmm. not really for you. It's just, it's for you to just to run life, right? Like, in a way. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, the idea of PTO goes hand in hand with flexible schedules, with remote work. It's basically just saying, we trust that you are professional, that you will get your work done, and we are not going to measure you based on the number of hours that you're sitting at your desk in the office. We're going to measure you based on your output. I, I think the uh, experience, I think uh, Netflix has it. I think Gusto might have it. And I think the what I've seen is statistically speaking is a lot of people even though they have unlimited, it's not like they're taken off for 12 weeks. They, they, they in a way, take less yeah, than yeah. they would if it was kind of forced upon. Like, you must take this many weeks. Yeah, but it feels it feels very different. I don't know, at least for me anyway. The people have differing opinions, but um, I am a huge fan of the unlimited PTO and the flexibility. Yeah. So it Makes sense. So what, what, what is going on this week in the world of cloud accounting? Uh, I feel like the biggest story... That was not a story, maybe. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I can just about this a little bit. Is Zero uh, approached? They sent an open letter, and they're starting a. Um, I think it's a change. dot org uh, petition petition to get the definition of the word accountant changed by the Oxford English Dictionary. Okay. Um, and there's lots of buzz about this. Oh, I, I saw on LinkedIn, people were posting things in huge fonts. It was on Facebook and Twitter. I finally, before we recorded today, sat down and read what they did. And this is where I mean, like, maybe it's not, it's the biggest non-story, uh -huh. but they're changing three words. Did you want to read the, what they're, what they're changing the definition to? Okay. So currently the definition of the word accountant in the dictionary is a person whose job is to keep or inspect on financial accounts. And Zero, Gary Turner, he's the uh, managing director at Zero in the UK. He has written a letter proposing that we add the, the two words at, and advise. So it would be accountant, a person whose job is to keep or inspect and advise on financial accounts. Did, did your mind just explode, David? <laughs> yeah, I, just, <laughs> it, 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 I don't know. It feels a little bit of an attention grab. Um but I think well, like, uh, but, you know, like I have to give it to them. Like it's a worthy attempt to get some attention uh, in the marketplace and to, you know, promote the accounting profession as being advisory, not just uh, inspecting or keeping accounts. But it's a little bit unfortunate that they made this push the same week that Expensify released their mind blowing rap video with two chains called, uh, well, I think the website's called expensifythis.com where you can go watch this video, right? But David, like, 
you got it for, for our listeners who haven't seen it themselves. You have to describe this uh, if you can. I, I, the, the, I, it's super, super genius. I did not. I mean, last week, I think we mentioned, hey, Expensify is going to run a Super Bowl ad. And I think that's really cool. You know, apps that were teeny 10 years ago, right? That were one guy in a booth by himself is now running a Super Bowl ad. I didn't expect it to be as massive as it is. And they, they basically have done an interactive Super Bowl ad. So they have a, I don't know who 2 Chains is until I saw this. So I don't know who this rapper is. So if those of you who don't, you're going to have to go to Expensify's, uh, expensifythis.com to see this video. And, and his, name, the- his name appears to be inaccurate because he's definitely wearing way more than two chains. I got you. <laughs> so, so it's a very stereotypical rap video. It's got a, like a Bugattis in it and uh, Audis and jet skis and gold plated footballs and gold plated toilets and i was watching it at work so i couldn't have the volume up too high but i I get the feeling it's a it's a rap video about making a rap video and all of the crazy stuff they have to buy to make the video and well david please continue and they're playing on expensing it all the time so they got to expense all these things in the rap video and so what the what what this is the genius part of expensive has done is they have uh receipts all over this video. And you, if you download the Expensify app, can take a photo of one of these receipts with your phone and on their app and then uh, have a chance to win that item or the cash value of that item. Yeah. And it's building up to the Super Bowl where, uh, is that a Bugatti? What's a, what kind of car is that? It's fast. Yeah, it's way it's better than a very, car driving. very expensive, fast car. Uh, some of the other items in the video that you can uh, expense. So, it, you, you know, you pause the video, take a picture with your Expensify app. They're basically trying to get millions and millions of people to download the Expensify app and, and see how easy it is to use, which is brilliant, right? And the items in the video are really funny. Um, there's a, a gold two chains bust that's like six thousand dollars. There's a wedding ring with two diamonds for two grand. There's an, a car made out of ice. Oh, that's going to be in the Super Bowl commercial. Uh, <laughs> there's a portrait of two chains by Sick Kid for fifteen hundred. A gold burger for forty eight hundred dollars. Oh, there's an Audi R eight. That's a nice car. That's 165K right there. Yeah. I guess somebody's going to win that? Th- apparently. And some of these prizes have multiple winners. Like there's some bottles of champagne or actually, I'm sorry, it's technically Ace of Spade champagne, which apparently is better than other champagnes. I'm not. Uh, seafood towers. They have all this Gold stuff. Toilet, I think teleportation they- machine. I don't think that thing really works. Luxury jet ski, diamond football, a gold ATM. The, the genius thing of this, right, is I'm – you're going to have they're going to have 20 million to 30 million seventh graders through college kids because this is where this is going to go viral well, i, I right? mean all downloading expensive and they have they're, they're locking up a customer base for the next 20 years well at least the, the people are going to know about it right and th- this is the genius of expensive marketing is they've always been a grassroots type of app they they've never gone top down like they don't go to the ceo of a company and say hey you exactly, should use Expensify yeah. and try to sell it to them. No, what they do is is they just make their um, they they make their app free for for employees. So employees who have to submit expense reports can just go sign up for Expensify and then use it to create their expense report, which they then email to their finance department or their accounting department. And then what happens is eventually everybody starts using it because everybody's like, oh, these expense reports look so good. Eventually, the CFO signs up because they want to have control and all the the benefits of you know owning the accounts and all that good stuff, right? They can they can automate the, the reimbursements and so so this is sort of like the same thing, right? The, it's the same strategy of of this. Uh, let's go to the users and get them trying it out and get them using it, and then um, you know they'll they'll bring along the management. Yeah, because they they're going to have this on their phone in their pocket, and the first time they're asked to file an expense report, they're like, I already got this cool one in my pocket. Why don't I just use this one? <laughs> And they're not going to use the top down one from the VP of some department. And it's proof of this is probably going to happen at EY. I think you found an article. Oh, yes. Like, it's funny that this is the same it week like this article comes so, out. So, uh, by the way, if you want to watch this video, and I highly recommend you do, unless you're offended by rap videos, go to expensifythis.com and check it out. It's hilarious. You know, maybe you'll win some money if you, if you expense those receipts. This video came out the same week as an article on going concern about Ernst & Young, their program Mercury, which is, a, I believe, their home-built expense management tool, which is apparently broken and not working. And there are a number of Ernst & Young staffers, employees, 
who have thousands and thousands of dollars of expenses that they're not getting reimbursed for because something's wrong with the app. And this is a problem because, you know, if you work for EY and you're traveling around as an auditor, you might be putting, you know, 10K of expenses on your credit card in a month. And now you're on the hook for it personally until EY reimburses you. So maybe Ernst & Young should just buy Expensify. Well, I imagine that this app for EY probably also has like a really good timesheet part in it to track the billable hour. And they spent all their time and focus making sure that part of the app worked, <laughs> the billable hour part, and that they didn't really code up the uh, expense part very well. But you're right. I, I think Monday morning after the Super Bowl, a bunch of EY employees are going to use Expensify to submit their uh, their uh, expense reports. Going and from forward. a bigger picture standpoint, I think this just proves, right? And, and by the way, Expensify is a fantastic application. It's one of the best mobile experiences I've ever had. And I've used a lot of apps. I think this shows that businesses and firms are way better off buying best of breed software than trying to build their own because accounting firms are not good software developers. They're generally pretty terrible at it. It's not their core competency. If you're a service provider, focus on delivering a service, partner with developers to create software that you can use to provide that service. It goes the other way too, right? Developers shouldn't be trying to provide services. Generally, you can leave that to the experts in that space. No, that makes sense. You're telling people to stay in their lanes. Yeah, stay in your lane. <laughs> Got it. What else? So um, this is uh, kind of, uh, again, here I go again with the, oh, the banks are not the banks or there's new banks, right? So this happened, I think, late last week. So we didn't make it, didn't make the cut for the show in time. But I don't know if you saw Square and I have three articles because there's good stuff in all three, but Square now has basically a debit card. Hmm. And the way this works is you can use it at other Square merchants and get a discount. So, wait, did, did Square, so that's awesome. Square got a banking license to do this or? No, no banking license okay, to do this. Okay, they one. Interesting. Yeah, so it's just to use like basically um, for so they're cutting the banks out. So you can use it anywhere Mastercard's use that. So they've kind of half partnered with Mastercard mm -hmm. on this, but they give you a discount at other Square merchants. So it's, so it's B two B. You know, and a really good quote. And before I go into some of the other articles with some interesting stats, so this is a photographer. It's CC Nedro, owner of Peyton's Photography. Um, but I'll just read the quote here: "With Square Card, the money I can make from a photo session is at my fingertips, so I can purchase the supplies I need to run my business, whether that's coffee with the client or props for last-minute replacement lens. So it's really like instantly, as soon as that client pays, you can start using that money to do X job. Yeah. So again, here we go again with instant payments, et cetera, right? A couple of other small notes I had on it that were really interesting. Um, so it's linked to your point mm -hmm. of sale system. So usually you have to wait for days before that gets in your bank account, or you can pay an extra fee to get it deposited the next day. Now it's instantaneous, no more bank transfers. So they directly just cut the banks right out of the picture. Oh, um, I guess. so this is coming out of your balance with Square that they owe you. Exactly. Um, and then the other interesting part of this is the tracking that the, somebody brought up a point about the tracking. This was an article on um, Amex's small biz trend site. This is at the bottom of the article. As part of the Square ecosystem, you'll be able to track business expenses in one place while separating your personal and business transactions. Are they just eliminating the need for an expense app? Because if I'm using Square and I have the Square debit card, and I'm just using that for my business expenses. I don't need a separate expense app like Expensify. Yeah. But then it, I'm thinking, where does that open the door to next, right? Um, is it a full-blown self-employment play? Like if they start tracking mileage next, like it's a full-blown end-to-end yeah. self-employed play. Right. You accept your payment, you track your expenses all in one place. So it's really, really interesting this Square getting in this game. Well, so Square is giving into it a run, run for its money. I think that's your takeaway here, right? Absolutely. Yes. I think Square, I could even argue in the US market, Square is a bigger competitor to Intuit than Zero is. I will buy that. So obviously they have point of sale. They do payments, invoices, gift cards. They have a dashboard, right? So they're in the reporting game. They have employee management. They do appointments. They do e-commerce. They do marketing, like marketing feedback stuff. They do payroll. They do capital slash loans, right? And customer engagement so like they and not to mention they're becoming right. a bank so they i mean the only thing they don't have is gl maybe that's next yeah so i, I think it's a, it's a big one speaking of into it and we haven't talked about the government shutdown yet on this episode but i think it's still going on right i haven't heard anything to the contrary into it is donating two million dollars to 
food banks supporting federal workers in the United States. And it actually may end up being larger than $2 million. Uh, they are also matching their own employee donations of up to $5,000. In other app news, Fishbowl, the, what do you, how do you think of Fishbowl, David? Inventory management? Yeah, Fishbowl's uh, an inventory app. Uh, they're, they really specialize in like high volume warehouse type inventory manufacturing. Um, you could argue Fishbowl won the app add-on game for QuickBooks Desktop. They were the biggest um, for the last 15, 20 years or so. Well, they are expanding into new markets. The application it has, they've recently added cannabis tracking and inventory management. So cannabis growers, cultivators, processors, and dispensaries who are under a lot of regulation uh, at a state level need to track movement of product and processing of product in very specific ways. So so uh, this includes barcode tracking for plant IDs, as well as lot numbers. Uh, it can track from the seed to harvested plant and accounts for the cost of soil, potting, fertilizers, and other supplies as needed. And then once the plant is harvested, Fishbowl links the cannabis plant ID throughout the process. Everything is rever reverse lot traceable. This is the regulation that's really important. You have to be able to track the production all the way from the seed to the, the completed goods. And then after the processing, the sellable goods are assigned a lot ID. So you can uh, have a history of location and history of the finished goods. That's all. I, I, I'm not really knowledgeable about the specifics of uh, cannabis accounting, but I do know that tracking all this stuff in detail is really important for your cost of goods sold because, you know, under federal law, um, only cost of goods sold is t a deductible, I believe, and everything else is not a deduction. So you really want to make sure you capture all your cost of goods sold really accurately and get the maximum deduction you can get. Yeah. And it kind of like leads into, you know, if, if in probably even now, it's probably just when, when this becomes legalized across the country and, but it's going to be heavily regulated. Right. In a way, similar to how the alcohol industry is uh, regulated. And I think you found an article related to that. Like Alvalera is acquiring an alcohol compliance services provider. Yes. And I think that shows, you know, Avalara is not just about sales tax compliance. Right. They also recognize that there are a lot of there's a lot of compliance around. What do we what do we call these goods? Uh, there's a name for like alcohol and, and marijuana. Yeah, no, no I, exactly. I know it, I, I, I hear it in my head, but I can't say it either. Um, but what's interesting about this for me is is because I've always viewed Avalara and then I've viewed you as an account or bookkeeper are going to use like a payroll service because you want to push the liability off of you, off your client, off of you and onto an ADP or a paychex, right? You want to push mm -hmm. off that liability, right? And the kind of the same thing you use Avalara because you want to push that liability of that sales mm -hmm. tax calculations and reporting to Avalara. And so, and I've seen this now start with like um, Zenefits and some of the HR stuff for your employees. You want to push all that, um, you have to, when you do open enrollment and all that, those types of things for HR policies and procedures, you want to offload that off of you and push that mm -hmm. right onto somebody else. And that's kind of that. I could see the same thing. Like Avalara is heading down that path. If, if there's other compliance things you have to do, it would be nice if you could offload that liability to bigger companies. Yeah. And, and, Specifically, the details about this um, Avalara acquisition is the uh, they have they've bought um, the operational assets of a company called Com Comply with an I at the end uh, that provides compliance services, technology, and software to producers, distributors, and importers of alcoholic beverages in the United States. And if, if I was Avalara, I would pull down my Avalara brand, which has like five syllables for in eight letters, and switch my name to Comply. Like they should just rebrand. Like the comply name's genius. It's much better, actually. <laughs> they, they, so that's just a little free branding tip out there, Avalara. So you don't spend billions on a rebranding uh, re effort. Yeah. You can just take the one you just bought. Uh, well, David, don't just give away for free. If if Avalara would like to rebrand to comply, then you know they just right cut you a check for about a hundred thousand dollars, and it'd probably be equivalent to what a branding agency might charge. Uh, yeah. You can work yeah. Out. Um. I did see just a small little quick one adding on to the mm -hmm. shutdown. Intuitive Accountant has a, uh, or Insightful Accountant, sorry, the URL is Intuitive Accountant, but it's actually Insightful <laughs> Accountant. They have a, a quick little article um, by Sandy Livia, uh, dated January 23rd. So it just came out two days ago. And it's essentially just tips on how to handle your, how to message and talk and handle your situation with your clients, right? With it's so tips like, yes, you still need to pay your taxes, whether or not they're shut down or not. Um, and 
just oh, just a bunch of quick tips. So just we'll put in the links. It's there. You probably want to go in and get it and check out this article because it's going to help you. Um, because you probably already have these cu- these questions coming in. You know about the taxes and the shutdown. Government shutdown tips. Got it. I found it. Sage apparently is selling their U.S. payroll solutions arm. Oh, I didn't see that. What's what's going on with that? Apparently, they had a U.S. based payroll service, so like a full service payroll similar to an ADP or Paychex. Sage did. I did not know this. Mm. Did you know this? They sold it for $100 million to a workforce management software maker called iSolved, little mm-hmm. I solved. Apparently, it's a private equity company that buys a lot of tech focused products. They basically, they, this is part of Sage's strategy to move to subscription software and cloud and, and their bigger so market. So, they're just not going to have a payroll option, or it's going to be like Zero does, where you have you know, a third party payroll service. If you look at the industry, everybody's adding payroll. Uh, we just talked about Square. Square's adding payroll. And so they were talking about that. This is, It's kind of strange, right, that they're taking payroll away. But apparently, they might actually use this to push harder on their Sage Business Cloud product, which does have oh, payroll in it. Oh, got it. it. All right. So, just rid of their legacy so it might payroll. be... Yeah, so this is kind of a legacy uh, division, and and I, and I can see that. I think it makes sense. It may have Sage Business Cloud, right? And that does a bunch of things. But if somebody can only subscribe to the payroll tool, and that works well with other accounting software packages, somebody could be a Sage Business Cloud payroll customer, mm-hmm. but still use other tools. Well, we've been talking a lot about cloud technology and what's going on with the apps. I'd like to shift it and and talk about the associations. I spotted an article in Strategic Finance Magazine, which is the uh, magazine for CMAs, um, the International Management Accountants Association. And this was about keeping, it's called Keeping the CMA Relevant. And it's about efforts to modernize the CMA exam and curriculum uh, to fit what CMAs are actually doing these days. I was very encouraged by this. They uh, did a survey, the IMA did a survey and found that Uh, there is an area that needs more coverage, specifically technology and data analytics. Quote, the job analysis results told us that given the changing nature of the profession, the exam should cover data analytics and in more depth and also cover the digitization of the finance value chain, which is, I think, just a fancy way of saying the technology stack that is being used in accounting. So they're making a a few changes. Part one of the CMA exam will contain a new section called technology and analytics. That will be 15% of the part one exam content. They're reducing some of the other areas to compensate. And then part two of the exam is going to have a greater emphasis on ethics and strategic decision-making. And it's very encouraging. I think this is really awesome. It's interesting to see the CMA taking the lead on this. I know that the CPA folks over at the AICPA have been talking about updating the exam and you know, we were, we were talking about this last week, actually. Susan Coffey is, week. is doing yeah, an initiative to modernize uh, the CPA exam or update, but they so far haven't actually done anything, uh, at least as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. So CMA taking the lead. And this is tied, I think, to another article that I read recently called Why CPA Candidate Numbers Have Decreased on Accounting Web. And it's a two-part article. Part two is the most interesting. It's by uh, Stephanie Ng. And she investigates why are there fewer people taking the CPA exam recently? Why do we have fewer candidates? In the 80s and 90s, we had about 120,000 to 140,000 candidates per year. They've mostly stayed below 100,000 since 2004, which is not that great considering that you know the economy has grown, but the numbers have dropped, right? And well, and, and they may have even dropped worse than those numbers indicate because in 2011 they started letting people take it the exam outside the U.S. Right. So the so the 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 N you're starting with is gig- even bigger than right. it has ever been, and, but the numbers are still decreasing. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There's a number of factors that may be responsible for this, right? Yeah, one you mentioned is um, international CPA candidates uh, at opening to them, but it's also gotten harder for them to meet the certification requirements. The one that sticks out to me that's relevant to the CMA is the the popularity of the, of the CMA, of other accounting certifications. The AICPA currently has about 431,000 members, uh, and as of April 2016, there were 664,000 active CPAs, a little more than that. But the number of CPA candidates is decreasing, and the number of CMA and CIA candidates is increasing. 
See, CMA, Certified Management Accountant. CIA is the uh, Certified Internal Auditor. In 2017, the CMA candidate numbers went up to 41,000, and their membership grew 11% to 90,000, more than 90,000. So it, it, it seems reasonable to me to think that um, folks are passing up the CPA and getting the CMA instead. I mean, we talked about this a couple episodes ago about accountant salaries kind of didn't increase. Yeah. Right. Um, and it looks like, you know, because I was thinking this about this article I was kind of going through. It was like, well, do they make more money if you're CMA? But, and and they, they do. They, they do. Yeah. So, so well, C- duh, C- then why wouldn't you do this? <laughs> yeah. CMAs are making more money than non-certified and certified public accountants. It's basically a lot easier to meet the requirements of the CMA if you're working in industry. Yeah. The Robert Half Salary Guide in 2019 said that uh, CIAs with just one to three years of experience in financial services can earn six-figure incomes. Wow. <laughs> it's certainly probably a lot more pleasant to be an internal auditor, given that amount of experience, than work in public accounting, you know, where you are working crazy hours auditing, right? Why wouldn't you go over to the client side and be an internal auditor instead? Yeah, and then that article also mentions like the millennials' attitude they want work-life balance. Yes, exactly. And they don't see that possibly. Nothing about saying I'm a CPA says I have work-life balance. Like they're just not seeing that message. Well, and you know what I think is the, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that the the biggest problem we have uh, with, with the CPA right now, I'm a CPA, is the culture in the big four. It's always been, you know, you work 60, 70 plus hour weeks for your first few years. And that is sort of like the pyramid scheme that has made the whole public accounting thing work, that is falling apart. And if we don't figure out a way to address that, then we're not going to have a lot of CPAs in the future. Yeah. I mean, I think Caleb Newquist has that blog, uh, Going Concern. And essentially, his target market are are disenfranchised employees of the big four. (laughs) He's got an entire website. That's his whole whole website, which he's turned into a whole business with multiple writers and multiple editors. He turned it just, just, and their only target market, that's it. Just like... Staff, staff in the big four, uh, big four. yeah, and it, well, there's you know probably like a hundred thousand of them, right? So yeah, you can have an entire publication just dedicated to them and to exposing the uh, stupidity <laughs> uh, of life in the big four. Sometimes I have another one that I don't want to miss this week. So the gist of this article is a second. Here's the headline: A second major bank adds fees to cover the cost of real time payments. So we keep talking about real time payments, right? If it's more efficient for everybody involved. Well, guess what? The banks aren't getting. They're they're seeing a revenue hit on all the extra fees, late fees, bounce checks, and all of that. So now they're the banks are trying to supplement that revenue by charging extra fees if you send payments in real time. I think that will backfire. I, I also I think it is backfiring, and uh, I did stumble upon an article on payments. Um, so I'll read the uh, the title: "The Big Tech Canary in the Faster Payments Coal Mine." So this quietly was kind of done the week of December fourteenth, right around when the shutdown started. I think right. There's an advocacy group called the Financial Innovation Now, and those members include Apple, Amazon, Google, Intuit, PayPal. Stripe, Square, again, what I would call are the new banks. I think I've said that before yeah. on the podcast. They submitted a public comment letter to the Fed in response to the Fed's proposal to create and operate a real-time payment system in the U.S. So I didn't know the Feds were building a real-time payment system or, or proposing to. Did you know well, this? Well, there's um, same-day ACH has been in the works for a while now, and it's not going to be instant, but it will be... Within an hour. Is that what they're talking about? I don't know. They, so I, I did not even know that there was a, a plan out there to respond to. Maybe we're going to have to do some research and do a follow up on this. But the, the real concern is that the, the, the letter highlight, and I'll read this directly. The letter highlighted the, that access to payment systems today is only possible through incumbent intermediaries, the banks and the card networks, which have not kept pace with the needs of consumers and businesses. So it's really these, there's the stake in the ground. All these companies are going to probably start bypassing the traditional rail system. Mm -hmm. Square's doing it within their own network. But what if Square's like, okay, hey, and you could do this with Intuit and PayPal and Stripe, and they just bypass the banks entirely. I mean, the volume of cash going through Google, Apple, and Amazon, Intuit, PayPal, Stripe, and Square is gigantic. Mm -hmm. The The banks are going to lose. 
this in the long run. Um, but I did not know the feds were getting in this game. And apparently it used to be a, uh, a decision. The Fed had the like 500 stakeholders to build consensus, um, but that's not moving fast enough, obviously. So I think this is something to really, really watch. It's kind of a longer read article. So I will uh, make sure that's in the show notes, but um, it was a surprise to me. The gist of it is the government thinks they can solve this. We already know the answer. They're not going to. They're not going to. You know, historically, they've, they've been in the interest of the banks. Right. And but tech is really pushing to solve this right. on their own and bypass them. Well, hey, I've got one last thing I want to share because I've been itching to share it for weeks and I've just never gotten to it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, CFO magazine metric of the month from this month, early January. And it is finance FTEs, full time employees per one billion dollars in revenue. Now, that sounds like a lot. Uh, this is about larger companies, but I think it says something about small businesses too. There's a chart in this in this article that is just so revealing. So the typical company, the median company with a billion dollars of revenue has about 69 employees in the finance and accounting team. The top performers, the best companies that are using the latest technology that have the best processes and systems in place have 36 employees. 36 at the top, 25%. Uh, the median is 69. The worst performing companies have 142, if I round up, 142 employees. So going from the top, 36, to the bottom, 141, you're almost quadrupling the number of people it takes to do the same work. So if I don't have, if I'm not implementing automation, so I'm, I have my billion dollar enterprise, and I have not, I don't, I, I just, I'm a CEO and or I'm the CFO and I haven't like told my staff, hey, try to automate some of your processes and they're just doing things the way they've done it the last 10, 20 years of their experience. I'm going to be paying a hundred extra people to do the same job 36 can yeah. be doing. And, and most of those people wow, above the you know 36 or so are really just pushing information around manually. They're doing a, a ton of transaction processing for things like payables, remittances, according to this survey. And I should say that this data comes from uh, APQC's Finance Organization Open Standards Benchmarking Survey. It's normalized by $1 billion in revenue, but almost 1,800 business entities that were surveyed have a, a large range. It's just saying per $1 billion in revenue. So I think this applies to smaller companies too, right? Maybe you've only got uh, 100 million in revenue or 50 million in revenue, right? This 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 concept still applies. And I see this. I've seen this in my own experience in accounting firms that are inefficient and, in, you know, accounting teams that are efficient versus inefficient. I, I myself, I always tell people that when I went from being a, a data entry focused bookkeeper on desktop software to cloud based with all the apps integrating and data flow, flowing seamlessly, I cut my job from 80% data entry down to 20%, maybe less, right? Now it's possible after, you know, 10 years later to do it probably with almost no data entry at all. Huge opportunity for uh, consulting organizations, for accounting firms to work with these bottom performers. Even the median ones, you can, you know, improve their efficiency by double. And that's what's so special about today, uh, where we're at, right? If, if, you, if you open a bookkeeping firm for small businesses, right? You, to do that 15 years ago, you'd have to get 10 employees. Yeah. I, right. To, to do yeah. that. And now you can do it just by yourself with automation and the apps and cloud accounting products and have basically what was equivalent of a, 15, a 10 person firm 15 years I, ago. I mean, I wouldn't be necessarily that aggressive. I would say you could take it, okay. but, but really close to it. I say you could, you know, a 10 person firm could be two or three people now. Yeah. Uh, or, a, or four or five person firm could be one person. Same thing here in, in corporate accounting. It's just they, they small businesses, small bookkeeping firms moved first because they're the most nimble. They can do it. There's not much margin so that, you know, if you do it, the rewards are huge. And there's not as much pressure in, in finance teams to uh, necessarily, you know, cut head counts or, or be more efficient in a lot of organizations. But there, there, there certainly will be over the next 10 years, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, you know, fixed fee or flat fee pricing really yeah. influences that, right? Because you, you're motivated to be more efficient. 
and so you're right. Internal departments don't have any of that pressure. So yeah, I mean, it's just the pressure. It's, <laughs> they're going to get their paycheck. As more departments become more efficient and CEOs and boards realize that, oh, wow, top performers are costing, you know, a quarter of the salary as the bottom performer, as we are, you know, maybe, maybe we could trim 1% of our expenses by improving our accounting and finance. And that's a, that's a, not an insubstantial increase to the top line or to the bottom line revenue, right? If you can trim a, a 1% of your expenses. Well, yeah. I mean, even for some of these companies, right? If you really relate this out to, especially in these numbers at this level, that that's eight to $10 million yeah. in salary that now you could maybe offer the rest of your company some additional uh, vacation time, pay time off, right? You, you, like, you can really put this money to work somewhere else versus just having people type in well, thing paper around. Which and you know what, what the thing we doing. didn't talk about, which will probably drive this more than anything else is the difficulty in finding talent, right? In recruiting employees as we get more labor shortages due to changing demographics, it's gonna be really hard to recruit, you know, the extra hundred employees you need if you're an inefficient accounting team. Everybody's going to have to do this at this point. If you're not, you're, you're not listening to this podcast. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. So but, <laughs> I think like, that's kind of where we're at. So, so if somebody's not listening to the podcast, Blake, and they wanted to tweet at you, what would they have to do? They could find me on Twitter. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. You should also visit my website, blakeoliver.com. Click the subscribe button, put in your email address. You will get the show notes for this podcast emailed to you the day after it goes live. Uh, every every time we drop an episode. And then you'll have all the links and descriptions to all the articles we're talking about. You can go read them yourself. You can post them on social media and everybody will think you're a genius because you know everything that's going on in the world of accounting technology. That's a, that sounds like a good pitch. Maybe we, we should put something extra in the uh, if the email you put out. Like that gets some bonus link or some extra <laughs> additional uh, little tchotchke in there just so people are motivated to sign up. They get an extra bonus story. The, the bonus story that didn't I'll make the cut. I'll let you figure that out, David. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's it. And where should people find you online, David? Uh, you can find me online at David Leary. And do not forget to go to our Facebook fan page. Cloud, and you can easy, very easily find us, Cloud Accounting Podcast. Um, and, you know, when you see an article go by, put some comments on it. Give us a like. That'd be great. Please, uh, if you enjoy this show, give us a rating on iTunes or your podcast service of choice it really helps us uh helps other accountants find the show helps get the word out better than almost anything else well with that david i look forward to chatting with you next week yeah unless i uh win something on that expensify app and i might be done <laughs> you're gonna retire all right retire. Cool. <laughs> I drive around my ice well car. you can rev the engine for us and then drive off into the sunset yes absolutely all right bye everybody